So it's actually not just me. There's going to be a, a few co-presenters. So uh, I, what I've done is I've um, prepared a video of all the exciting things that we're going to be talking about. Uh, I'm going to present that. But what I'm also going to be doing is I'm going to be in the discussion boards and I'll be answering questions and stuff like that. So if you have any questions as a talk that's going on, hit that discuss button, uh, hit the Q&A, um, ask away, and I will be happy to answer as the talk is proceeding. But for now, let me just press all the magic buttons. Hi, my name is Simon Stewart, and I'm here to talk to you about the State of the Union. A little bit about me before we begin. I am the lead of the Selenium project. I'm the co-editor of the W3C uh, WebDriver specification, um, and I am also the owner of the Java bindings. I know it's a little bit weird to do a conference like this, and I haven't done it very often, and I don't know how you feel about it either, but I hope this is going to be all right. Because I've got some people co-presenting with me, what I've done is I've recorded a lot of this talk before now, but I am uh, live, I am listening, and I'm taking part in the discussion. So if you have any questions or anything like that, feel free to ask them, and I will answer them online um, as we're going through this presentation. So yeah, well, welcome to this um, virtual Selenium Conf. As is traditional, I'm going to be telling you about what's been happening in the world of the Selenium project. But before we begin, I think, I think it's helpful to sort of explain a little bit about, about what, what I'm thinking and, and how we're approaching things. And the best way that I have for that is to describe to you the scientific method. Now, this is um, obviously one of the most successful ways of, a, of improving a theory or a practice that mankind has ever invented. You know, humanity's rise to civilization has really been powered by this thing. And, you know, it's, it's how we ended up with the modern world uh, <clears throat> that we know and we love. Like, we wouldn't have computers and we wouldn't have the internet if it hadn't been for people um, working uh, and developing theories and, and figuring it all out. But what exactly is the scientific theory? Well, you can think of it as a simple three-step process that you repeat iteratively. First thing you do is you make a guess. You don't really know how something works or, or uh, the exact mechanics of it, but you can make a model of it in your head and you can make a guess. And, and we sometimes call these guesses hypotheses or theories. The guess is a model of how we believe um, the world works and, and it should describe the uh, observations we have made already. So, you know, a, a theory or the guess is not so much gravity is made out of monkeys, which is clearly ludicrous, but more like the world sucks as a way of describing gravity. Now, once we have a theory, once we have a sort of basic idea of how we think things should work, we can then write some experiments and that will allow us to figure out whether or not our theory is correct. So what we do is we make a prediction using our theory, we test that prediction using an experiment and we observe the outcome. And as we measure things from the experiment, uh, we see whether or not they match their model. When things don't match, actually that's when it gets really exciting. When things don't match, we know that our model is wrong. Put another way, we can't ever really know if we're right, but we can be very sure when we're wrong. Now the nice thing is that when we find things that are wrong, when we find results that are inconsistent, we know that our theory is wrong. Reality can never be wrong. We know our theory must be wrong. Now what we can do is we can use the new information we have gained from our observations and our experiment to refine our model um, and think about how the world works more closely. We can then take that model that we have created again and we can apply it one more time to figure out whether or not something should happen. We can run more experiments, we can do more refinement. And in this way, we iteratively work our way towards something really elegant and nice, or perhaps just a good understanding of how something works. Let's take an example. There was this chap, Newton, who was once sitting underneath an apple tree, and then he was cruelly assaulted by it. An apple fell on his head, and the story goes that this is what allowed him to come up with a theory of gravity a model of how the world works, how gravity works, how things are attracted to each other, a mechanistic model. And for a long time, that model actually was really good. It correctly uh, matched observations. He made theories and, and experiments, and those experiments matched the, the outcome that the model should have. It was brilliant. But there were problems. There were things that that model didn't explain, and there were experiments that were quite hard to, to imagine. And then a long time after, after Newton died, this chap, Einstein came along. 
And he postulated a model that combined all manner of things into what's known as the general theory of relativity. This explained the mechanics of Newtonian physics, but also it suggested the existence of things like black holes and gravitational waves. These are fantastic because you can make um, experiments to figure out whether or not uh, the world, the universe, actually matches this, this theory. And it turns out that as far as we can see, Einstein isn't wrong. What we can take from this is that the early model that Newton pr uh, proposed wasn't wrong. It was just that Einstein was more right. What on earth has this got to do with selenium? In my mind, um, and hopefully, you know, as you can see as we as we go through this talk, um, we try and run selenium using the scientific method. You can think of selenium RC, selenium one, as our initial guess, a theory or a hypothesis a model of how to do web testing. And over the years, what we did is we observed the usage and made some refinements. And we ended up with WebDriver. This has been a very long process. And, you know, it isn't over. It's never over. It continues. The process is ongoing and applies not only to the code, but how we run the project. With that in mind, I'd like to introduce David Burns. He's the maintainer of the Python bindings, a member of the Project TLC, co-editor of the WebDriver spec, <gasps> and chair of the W3Z Browser Tools and Testing Working Group. He's also a good friend of mine. So please, David, take it away. Thank you for the kind introduction, Simon. Hi everyone, my name is David and I head up the open source work at BrowserStack, primarily working on Selenium. I've been with the project for over a decade now and I'm the co-editor of the WebDriver specification with Simon and I previously owned the Gecko Driver project when I was at Mozilla. Today I'm going to be talking about the work the Selenium project is putting into diversity and inclusion to make it a safe space for everyone. In the past, we've always had the opinion that we must be excellent to each other. And for the most part, this has worked. We have always been fortunate that we've never had any incidents. But when we start to apply some scientific methods, looking deeper into everything, it showed that we really needed to improve. We knew that we need to look at how we approach problems and what methods people could communicate with us if there was an issue. And when we started to look at this, we realized we, we had survivorship bias. Survivorship bias is the idea that we look at the people who survived our process who, and who could tell us what problems we had. Survivorship bias was used in World War II when people used to look at damage on planes that used to return. They would mark it all out and say, this is where we need to put more armor. Unfortunately, uh, this is not where the armor really was needed. And a statistician, a chap called Walt, uh, described that we should be fixing and putting more armor where there are no holes. Because these are the areas where we can never look at the planes that aren't returning. And those are the areas that have catastrophic failures. With this in mind, uh, we have teamed up with Sage Sharp uh, from Otter Technologies to help us make sure that we have inclusive policies within the project. These policies will extend to anything that uses the Selenium brand. These include the conference that you're at today, all the way down to local meetups, Anything that's using the brand and kind of could be seen as a Selenium event will be using these policies. We want to make sure that we have safe spaces for everyone so that we can lead to a place where everyone is inclusive, everyone is different, and everyone is safe. We know we're not going to be perfect, as nothing ever is, but by making sure that we put processes in place, we can always be improving them, tweaking them, making sure that we continue to maintain diversity and inclusion where possible. Of course, our efforts around safety and inclusion and diversity are a part of a bigger picture about how we run the project. To cover this in more detail, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Diego Molina. Thank you, David, for the introduction. Hi, everyone. This is Diego. I am part of the Technical Leadership Committee. 
I contribute actively to the Docker Selenium images, Selenium website and documentation, Selenium Grid, and recently to organizational topics such as the project governance. From its beginnings, the Selenium project has always been very open and welcoming. As a first approach, there were a set of known processes running the project in a simple way. A project leadership committee was in charge of dealing with major administrative things in the project and also served as an interface with the Software Freedom Conservancy. In addition, the process of becoming a committer grew organically, so you needed to start contributing to the project, and at some point an existing committer would notice your contributions and ask if you wanted to join the project. Then, an email to the Selenium developers was sent and everyone would reply with a plus one to express their approval. That approach worked, but we saw an opportunity to improve it. All these processes were, let's say, implicit, undocumented knowledge. We didn't have anything written or structured in a way that anyone could understand the process from outside the project. As the project kept growing and expanding, more people joined, but also some people left. And parts of that implicit, undocumented knowledge left with them. The work being done for the upcoming Selenium 4 release has been an opportunity to improve and refine the project, not only technically, but also in an organizational way. Therefore, we are updating the project governance. We have been working on writing down how things should be run to keep this knowledge within the Selenium project and make it transparent for anyone who wants to join the project. We are doing all this because there are lots of possibilities in the future of the project. However, to get there, we need to have clear roles and responsibilities, and a project that is still open and welcoming to everyone. To show you how we're doing this, let me share the structure of the project, its roles and responsibilities. Spoiler alert, you're also part of it. Let's start with the triage team. Over time, some community members have been helping the project to answer questions and identifying bugs. They are now part of the triage team, offering all their expertise and knowledge to all our users. Their role is to help triage issues and potentially submit pull requests with fixes or at least a failing test to help the committers recreate the issue. You will see them often replying to GitHub issues or helping the community in our IRC Slack channels. Another important role in the project is the committers, and there is a defined team for them across all the Selenium projects. These are folks who have shown that they are committed to the continued development of the project through ongoing engagement with the community. They are the ones who can manage changes and make them into the code base and help any newcomer to land their code contributions to the project by reviewing pull requests and also triaging issues. We also have two committees in charge of governing and running major things in the project, the PLC and TLC. Let me explain what they do. The overall continuity and future of the project is overseen by the Project Leadership Committee, PLC, which acts as a bridge between Selenium and the Software Freedom Conservancy. Since there are many different facets to the Selenium project, the PLC wants to reflect more than just people who code, but rather the community as a whole. On the other hand, technical decisions and roadmap of the Selenium project are governed by a technical leadership committee, TLC, which is responsible for high-level technical guidance of the project. These two committees work actively to keep the Selenium project balanced and focused on the needs of the community. And the most important part of the structure is all of you, the community. Anyone can be part of the project. There are no special requirements. If you have done things like giving a talk about Selenium, raised awareness of the project and its benefits, maybe reported a bug 
as a GitHub issue or a proposed new feature. If you have helped someone else to overcome a challenge while using Selenium, or maybe you have organized a Selenium meetup, or collaborated in a Selenium conference, maybe you just have said thank you to the members of the project. You are already contributing to Selenium. Thank you. We have already some great achievements, like some new project members and the establishment of a public project meeting every two weeks, where we discuss the ongoing project developments. But this is just the beginning, and we know there are many more good things to come, but we need your help and feedback to get there. And talking about feedback and help, let me introduce Manush to you. He will share more details on how you can contribute to the project. Thank you for the introduction, Diego. Hey folks, I hope you're all doing well and safe at home. I'm up next going to talk about the most commonly asked question to an open source contributor. That is, how can I contribute? I'm going to share a few areas in Selenium project where you could come and contribute, which also may be relevant to the other projects as well. We all know that Simon is all getting us in the physics world very swiftly. Before we begin, I would like to share a quote by Sir C.V. Raman, the first Asian to have received a Nobel Prize in Physics. He says, I am the master of my failure. If I never fail, how will I ever learn? Which greatly fits well within our theory on when things don't match, we know that our model is wrong. And we should always look at redefining our models and experiments and we reinvent ourselves for the betterment of life. Yes, the scientific method. So I'd like to start off um, talking about the website itself, the face of the project, um, which if you remember, um, this is how it used to look like early, the, the bluish uh, one. We set out of the documentation on Selenium HQ ORG. Our original guess was based on a restructured format, the RST. Well, it worked well and served the purpose to an extent, but it wasn't friendly enough for someone who can come and contribute. And it coupled with other tech complexities as well. So we redefined and adopted a modern and a more friendly markup language called the Markdown, which was good. And we had quite a few contributors coming up and contributing to the documentation. And we also applied the same thinking to the whole Selenium HQ website and the documentation in order for it to be a now redefined with a newer look using a Hugo framework, unlike the old website, which looked like a project was 50 years old. So documentation is an area where you could still come and contribute. Selenium.dev is the new home for the Selenium project. You could come and write a blog. Selenium HQ blog is now integrated with Selenium.dev. So something interesting that you've done with Selenium, um, you could come and look at the documentation and if there is any missing code pieces, contribute code examples and samples. And most of the documentation, if you see, are written by a non-native English speakers. So that means if you're someone good at English, you could come and contribute by proofreading and making some grammatical changes. That would be of a great help. And next, if you see from a support perspective, we all know Selenium is open source. It is by the community and for the community. The original guess was the support would happen through Google Groups. If you all remember, we had Selenium users group and we also had the WebDriver mailing list where people would ask a question and someone would, would come and answer. I think one of the famous names that you could usually think of is Krishnan Mahadevan, who used to pretty much answer every question. At one stage, I used to compete with him, but then I lost the battle. He was so consistent in, in answering questions. But then to an extent, people wanted a nicer and a more synchronous way of communication. Uh, but then IRC was there, which didn't serve the purpose well because it was mostly blocked by most of the companies that I know in India, at least. Um, so we observed and we looked at adopting and supporting the modern IRC um, called the Slack. Uh, 
which is my way of saying, um, which is actually mirrored. So we have the IRC and Slack mirrored each other. So it's a two-way communication. When someone pings an IRC, it gets relayed onto Slack and the vice versa as well. And I believe it was supported by Titus, who was instrumental in bringing this idea and supported by a few other committers, which was really great. And now we have Slack, IRC and the Google Groups Medium. And of course, we have other forums like Stack Overflow. So answer questions, um, you know, keep the Selenium community alive, um, write how to guide. If you look at the documentation, I think the getting started guide in Selenium 4 at least, and you know, how to start a grid uh, with uh, Selenium Alpha jars, it's, it's, it's something it's still missing. So you could, if you know something about it, you could come and contribute. Um, and you can look at triaging issues um, as like any other projects there are many open source open issues that are available in github uh, you could come and look at those triaging and helping us finding why an issue has been open for a long time it could be either author author has resolved himself but he's not responsive uh, to update the thread and close it so you could follow up you could test a particular issue and see if that is reproducible and work with a committer uh, in that way um, there is a there is a pairing between you um, who's testing an issue and pairing with a committer um, so you could potentially become um, an easy you know I would say that is an easy way to become a committer as well and we have many folks um, who who came down that path and become a committer now which I'll share uh, shortly uh, but so these are a couple of areas um, that you could come and contribute and more from an events per se. I think Selenium Conference is an area that you could come and contribute. Uh, and every year we get tons and tons of proposal. Um, so if if you're someone who like to ask questions about ideas and get clarified and you could come and join the uh, program committee uh, Selenium conference happens every year, alternate years in India and the rest of the world um, uh, every year. Uh, I think the next one is in Chicago um, fall. Uh, so we could come and contributing uh, to that. And of course, we if if you are in in the area where the next Selenium conference is, like I said, the next one is in Chicago. So if you are based in Chicago, if if you are someone who's local, you could come and help. And I know folks like, you know, Zachary Atas and Lydia Tripp, um, who were locals and who helped us greatly in, in organizing our last conference. So, um, and, and likewise in India, we have Anand, Naresh, um, Sai Krishna, Srinivasan, Pooja, and a and lot of other um, volunteers helping us run this show. Um, so this is, again, one of the areas that you could contribute and so these are some of the non-tech um, things of area where you could contribute to selenium project and next is code hack code who doesn't love code everyone can code well um, three things coming to my mind you could write tests um, enhance our tests um, alpha you can do some alpha and beta tests for selenium 4 um, you could do some um, help on the JavaScript bindings um, that needs help. And right now we don't have actively someone maintaining JavaScript bindings. So if you're someone who's good at JavaScript, you could come and help us there. Um, and I've made this code, um, you know, contributing code to a last thing purposefully because um, Selenium project is, is a space where we value, we value contribution at every level someone who contributes to documentation is on the same level as someone who contributes to code so that is how we see as um, contributors and we celebrate new committers that coming up that way and as diego mentioned earlier on on you know forming a governance uh, way uh, for the project and and forming up the plc and tlc way which actually you know leading up to having a documentation team and a triage team as well and in that way, we have found some new uh, committers, um, unlike the last version of Selenium Conference that we had. Uh, this time, I'm very happy and glad to introduce uh, new committers to the project. 
um, starting off with Sri Sri Hasha. He's been contributing heavily on the documentation. He's also now contributing to JavaScript bindings and and earned a commit bit for Selenium as well. And Rajendra uh, from BrowserStack um, been contributing heavily on the grid stuff. Pooja again from BrowserStack has been contributing um, well on the observability and tracing aspect of Selenium Grid. Some nice work there. And Andrew has been there for the long time with the project, um, helping on um, the event space conference, Selenium conference. And Chris um, has been very active in supporting any questions asked in Slack. I think he's been called as the Salmon Mode. If you're in a Slack and if you're wondering who is Salmon Mode, that's Chris. He's here. Um, and welcome to the team folks we are very happy and glad to have you and uh, this is an inspiration um, for most of you who's looking at it so contributing to code is not the only way to become a committer but you can start small and then find your way up there and these folks are you know example that we have in front um, that said step forward contribute to the selenium project and make it better over to you simon Thank you, Manoj and uh, David and Diego. Um, and I'd also like to add my congratulations to Sri, Andrew, Chris, Rajendra and Pooja. It's fantastic seeing so many new faces join the project and also seeing some old timers who have been with us for a long time be recognised um, for the valuable contributions they make. It's, you know, the project wouldn't be anything without people like these. So thank you very much. So, yes. The scientific method, that's where we were. So we can go all the way back in time to the very first version of, of Selenium. This is a screenshot of, of one of the early releases of Selenium IDE. We started out with, with Selenium Core, with Selenium RC, and, and that was our initial guess, right? That was our first theory. And it worked, and it was solid. It was very much like sort of Newtonian physics. It, it solved a problem and it solved it well. And it showed us that browser automation was a really useful and powerful tool, but there were problems. And, and one of those is that it was trapped in the JavaScript sandbox. And you know, while that didn't matter much to begin with, it, it would become a problem later. You see, in the time of Selenium RC, it was unusual for pages to use much JavaScript at all. Quite often, there'd be a single page, you'd fill out a form, you'd hit the submit button, the form would go all the way back to the server, it would render the response and send it back to you. You know, pages weren't very dynamic and, and that was fine. Uh, it would allow you to, to type things in with, with JavaScript and, and you were done, basically. But then we had Web 2.0. And uh, for me, uh, the first time where I had to really throw uh, WebDriver, which was a project that I'd started at this problem, was when I was contacted by um, a team at Google. Now, the first team that really put WebDriver through its paces um, was the Google Photos team, but the second team was Google Wave, and uh, I worked quite closely with them. Um, and that forced us to um, push a lot of um, functionality into Selenium and into WebDriver, right? That was a very rich web app. I, I know that it wasn't terribly successful, and I know nowadays it's a sort of footnote in history, but at the time, it was cutting edge. It pushed browsers absolutely to the limit. And one of the things that showed us is that the model of binding tightly to the browser was a good idea and it encouraged us to emulate user input ever more closely. So we were trying desperately to be as close as we could to a sort of high fidelity user experience. The other thing that we um, had observed with Selenium RC is that the initial API was considered by some to be very simple because it was incredibly flat, but by others to be confusing and difficult to use because it was so large and parameters, um, it wasn't always clear what you should be passing in. So the other thing that we did is with WebDriver, we took a look at how people use things and we came up with what we thought was a simpler API. Now, don't forget, this was right at the beginning of the sort of Web 2.0 era. And so, uh, you know, this seemed like a, a good fit. We had a bunch of things that, that seemed to make a lot of sense. And even to this day, this API has stood the test of time. It's still pretty easy to use. It still allows us to do many of the things that we want to do. And this is our refined guess. Browser automation should look the WebDriver APIs that we ship as part of Selenium. But time doesn't stand still and the world continues to move on. The original model of WebDriver was one of request response. You know, you would um, perform an action, you would send it over to the uh, to the browser to execute in its context and it would 
clear error would find an element and, and then the response would come back to you. But modern applications are actually far more active now. They're doing things all the time, firing events. And so we need to refine our guess, our theory, once again, based on the observations we've made. And, you know, there are, I think there are several that, that come out of this, the sort of the modern web. So the first observation we made is that finding elements on a page is really difficult. I mean, we wish it was simple. We wish it was easy, but it's not. And you can see how difficult it is by seeing how many talks at SeleniumConf there are over the years that have tried to cover locator strategies, how to make them robust, how to make them strong. I know that when I work with teams, quite often there are very sophisticated expats that people have crafted carefully. These things are very, very fragile, but they're what people need in order to find that one element. You know, I've seen people do amazing things with CSS locators as well. It's fantastic. But you know what? There really has to be an easier way to do this. Now, we are fortunate at this conference to have Narayan Raman, who is the creator of Sahi, talking. And I really do suggest you go and attend his talk. But one of the things that Sahi introduced to the world, it blazed a trail, was locators based on human readable descriptors of where elements were on the page. You don't say this element is located so far down the dom as a child of this. And no, no, no. What you do is you say, oh, you want the image that happens to be above this particular element. Or you want to say, I'll have something that's to the left or to the right of it. And so we've added something similar to Selenium 4. We call them relative locators. Back in the day, we called them friendly locators. Um, because we thought they were nice and, and, and easy to use. But I think actually relative describes what they do more closely. And although the idea originated in Sahi, you can find this in other browser automation frameworks as well, notably Gage from ThoughtWorks. That is one of the ones that has it, and Tycho as well, I believe. So yes, we have added these relative locators, and they're a great way of finding elements. Another observation we made, and the thing that we heard very clearly, is that people want to use their web tests to be alerted to events happening on the page. Those events that might be happening um, might be something as simple as JavaScript errors. People might want to go, I want to fail the test if there are any JavaScript errors that are thrown on the page. We've moved from a world where we uh, have request response to one where we get events, right? If you call um, the Java, uh, JavaScript console APIs, for example, it'd be nice to know what was being called there. The most popular of the other events that people want to listen out for, other than JavaScript errors, are changes in the DOM. You want to know when it's safe to continue your test, and you want to know when something is finished happening, um, and you want to be notified when things change. Now, we could just poll for these changes, and uh, we did that with explicit weights. You can do that right now. You know, it'd be nice if you could be notified if something changed, right? Another observation we made is that people want information about network traffic. The most infamous issue in Selenium history was to do with returning status codes of a page. I was never really sure what that meant because a page is composed of so many different elements. Did they want me to add up all the status codes and divide by the number of requests to give you some sort of average status code? Or did they want the index.html status code? Or, you know, what, what did people want? <sighs> I never understood it, but it is something that people want to do. Another thing that's happened, particularly as um, people are moving toward a world of microservices and, and more distributed applications, is people want to be able to stub out network traffic. And they want to allow them uh, allow themselves to test an application in isolation from potentially unstable backends. And that's a really useful thing. Previously, we've suggested people do this using proxies, and those are easy to integrate with Selenium. But you know, people want more. And finally, another request we've heard a lot about has been support for authenticating the browser with a web page. Again, these are normally uh, the solution we normally suggest to people is to use a proxy. The browser mob proxy uh, is one of them. And, and Jim Evans has written a series of blog posts about how to integrate a proxy with your Selenium tests. But, you know, people kind of like having everything be supplied in the same package for them to use at the same time. Authentication on a web page is typically done using basic or digest authentication. It's where you go to the page and you get a little modal dialog that pops up. And when a user visits the page, um, they have to type in the username and password. Typically, that's that's what they need to do. Um, now, you know, if you didn't want to use a proxy, one way that you used to be able to get around this was by crafting URLs carefully. You could put a, an authentication section 
into a URL. But more and more browsers these days don't make that an option. And so we need to come up with a mechanism that allows you to support all of these features in your tests using WebDriver. Well, I've some good news for you, because in Selenium 4, all of these things are available. Let's have a quick look. This is a, a demo that we have. We've been working to make the APIs as intuitive as possible. So here we go. You can see here that we are testing relative locators. We go to um, the internet by Dave Hefner. We want to find an element. And then we want to find below that an input element and um, below this anchor element that we selected. So there you go. What we'll do, we'll highlight that element when we run the test. And we'll just assert that it's selected. The next thing we're going to do is listen out for some console events. So again, we go to the internet. And there's this complicated looking piece of code here, but, but don't worry about it too much. All we're doing is we're listening out for a console event. And when we see hello world, we set a latch. Um, and that means that we can continue. We then execute some JavaScript that calls console uh, log and, and says hello world. And we check that within five seconds, that latch has been triggered. So that piece of code has been passed. The next thing we're going to do is um, we're going to stub out some network traffic. So here's a request. Anything that uh, looks for a logo and ends with SVG, we are going to return a picture of a kitten. Yes, you heard me right, a picture of a kitten. So what we're going to do, we're going to um, go to DuckDuckGo, and we will find um, the logo, and we will highlight the element once more. And now we're going to show off um, authentication. So we're going to authenticate using admin and admin as our, as our username and password. And I'm going to pause here just so you can see that we're going to the, the basic digest page. And, and these are the username and password that we should type. But we're going to find the content. And we're going to make sure it contains a string congratulations. So let's run this. Here you go. Here is the internet. You'll see, actually, it's a little bit further up basic. And we've indicated that we found the correct thing. This is the console log. That's a checkbox using the relative locators. And there we go. DuckDuckGo with a picture of a, of a, of a kitten. And that's fantastic. So there we go. We've seen all the pieces fit together. Um, you can imagine how you could use those things in your own tests in order to make them more capable, more flexible, and uh, do more and exciting things. So how does all this extra functionality work? Well, currently, most of it is based off the Chrome debugging protocol. This is the protocol that is spoken by browsers that are based on Chromium, um, that is largely Chrome and Microsoft Edge, that allows you to hook into various events that are happening within the browser. Um, but browser developers and others, including members of the Selenium team, are working on a W3C spec, extending WebDriver, to allow it to also send events back to a waiting test. This means that in the future, browsers other than those based on Chromium can take advantage of these features. And that's going to be really important because one of the things that I think is, is not healthy for the open web is for there to be a browser monoculture. That can't be good. That also means, because we're planning on having a WebDriver by die specification, that we have to be very careful to decouple how the new features work from the APIs that they use. Now, this is a major difference between Selenium and some of the other testing tools out there, uh, such as Puppeteer, because what it allows us to do, because we have that decoupling, is that one version of Selenium can support many different versions of Chrome and Edge at the same time without you needing to download um, a different version of the, the, the tool that you're using. And that means that you can take your test, you can pin your version of Selenium, and you can just pull in the versions of uh, the CDP that you need to use for your tests. Um, and that makes everything a bit more robust and a bit more stable. But you know, we haven't just been working on the user-facing APIs that you know and hopefully love. Um, Selenium 4 doesn't stop there. Our original guess about how to distribute tests across a fleet of machines was the Selenium grid. Now, there are one version that was uh, written 
that supported Selenium RC alone. And then the second version, which is actually what we're using now, which supports, uh, supported both Selenium RC and the WebDriver protocol. Now that grid has stood the test of time remarkably well. It's proved capable, but like all things, starting to show its age. It's a bit long in the tooth. What has changed? When the original grid shipped, none of these technologies existed that you see on this slide here. There was no Docker, there was no Kubernetes, there was no Azure, there was no Amazon Web Services, and there was no Google Cloud Platform, GCP. How we deploy grids on machines has changed radically. When Grid 2 first shipped, what we would do is we would have a VMware instance or a series of actual physical machines in a, in a rack room somewhere, and these would be running the browsers. Nowadays, we can deploy to the cloud or we can take advantage of um, Selenium as a service providers, such as um, Source Labs and BrowserStack. How we do this has changed so much. Basically, we want the Selenium grid to, to cope with these new technologies. Now, there are projects such as Selenium, which have enabled uh, the original Selenium grid to continue to focus, to work and to take advantage of these things. But, you know, we could do better, but only if we changed some of the design. So in Selenium 4, we're refining grid based on the observations we've seen. If you went to the grid workshop yesterday, you'll have had a taste of it. We're designing it to be possible to scale using modern hardware and technologies and to support ever larger fleets of browsers because we know that's important to you. We also know that teams such as Aerocube allow you to have very large grids as well. We know this is something that people want. And what we're doing in Selenium 4 is we're refining grid to enable you to have those very large fleets based on modern technologies deployed in modern infrastructure. It's going to be very exciting. So the question that I get asked more than anything is, uh, <clears throat> when, when will Selenium 4 ship? The standard answer we give is, is that we're going to ship it before Chinese New Year, but we then omit the year, so we give ourselves a lot of time. But the last major Selenium release, 3.14159, was in November 2018. It has been a while. We're working hard on Selenium 4, but we're not yet quite sure when to ship it. The recent Selenium 4 alpha are, are coming to an end. I think the next one will be the last one. And then we're going to start on the betas. Those betas should be relatively short. We're going to be asking for feedback from people and we're trying to make it um, as, as solid and as capable as possible. We're making nightly Docker images available for you to start testing already if you want to try out Grid. If you just plan to use WebDriver on the client side in, in your tests, the alphas should be a drop-in upgrade and you should be able to use them right now. If that's not the case, if it's not a drop-in upgrade, please let us know. We've worked really hard to ensure backwards compatibility, but sometimes mistakes are made and things fall through the cracks. If you let us know, we can fix things. So please try them out and give us some feedback. That would be really good. It will also give you the ability to try out some of the new features that we're, that we're baking into Selenium 4, which I hope you're kind of looking forward to. For Grid 4, if you're fle feeling brave, please do give the alphas a go. We're waiting to hear from you which features you really need before we ship 4.0. We know that there are gaps and we're working hard to close those. So in order to answer the question, when will Selenium 4 be available? All I can say is we have a pile of work to do and we're going through it as quickly as we could. We'd really hoped it would all be done by now, but we're working hard and it looks like we're in touching distance of the finishing line. And I'm very excited about that. Of course, once 4.0 ships, we're going to be shifting our focus to Selenium 5. What features will this bring? I'm not exactly sure. After Selenium 4, I'll be stepping down as the project lead and the PLC and the TLC will be pulling even more weight than they do already. This is one of the reasons why we've been putting so much effort into making sure the governance of the project um, is, is strong and effective and clear. We have the Slack and IRC channels where you can come and ask us for help and support. So, you know, that would be a great place to come in and, and talk to us about things that you really wish Selenium would do. I suspect very much that the project will be focusing on making Selenium more user-friendly and polishing rough edges. There are a handful of things where right now we suggest going to third-party libraries, and maybe we could find some way of just linking to those libraries and suggest suggesting people use them, or otherwise making it easier to pull down a sort of bundle of things that we know work together well. As an example of a rough edge, if you use Chrome or Edge or Firefox, you need to download the appropriate driver, 
and that driver binary, Gecko driver, uh, Microsoft Edge driver, Chrome driver, needs to be specific to the browser you're using. So there's a lot to juggle and get right. But you know, the key thing here is Selenium is an open source project. If there's something you'd like to see in it, just as Manoj said, you should feel free to come and join us. Even a little bit of help goes a really, really long way and we could do with all the help that we can find. So finally, with that, I'd like to say thank you for your time and attention. I'd like to say thank you to David, Diego and Manoj for their hard work helping prepare this presentation. And I'd like to wish you all a great conference. Happy hacking, folks, and I hope you have a fantastic time. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Well, thank you very much. Simon, thank you very much. That was a great talk. Uh, I think possibly if this would have been in person, this would have been my third time sharing a stage with you. But nevertheless, I did feel so, and hopefully people uh, caring from wherever to a part of the world will do feel the same. Uh, well, thank you very much for your help putting that all together. It wouldn't have been possible without you. And thank you, everyone, by the way, for all the comments and the discussion that was going on in the background. I really enjoyed that. Yeah. I think, I think we may have actually answered all of the questions. That's right. I was just checking the Q&A panel. I think it's mostly done. Thank you, Simon, for the multitasking, as Diego mentioned. Uh, it's multitasking at its peak. <laughs> <laughs> All right, with that, uh, thank you. Uh, we hope to see you in the next uh, Serenium Conference Chicago. Until then. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, enjoy the rest of the conference and take care.